I think Bitcoin is the least risky investment of any asset that you can find. I think real estate is a scary investment. I see that as a bubble that will demonetize. I think that gold will just drift down and lose money against Bitcoin. I think, you know, the stock market is is a loser's casino. It's It's really, really hard to consistently make money in the stock market, which is why Warren Buffett says just, you know, buy the S&P tracker and forget about it because stock picking is is just such a difficult game. So if I think about Bitcoin as a risk asset compared to other risk assets, I think it's it's barely even a risk asset. What I'm talking about is what are risks to Bitcoin? And, you know, we talk about quantum computing. There is obviously SHA-256 signatures within Bitcoin that are essentially quantum proof if you don't have multiple UTXOs in your wallet. But, you know, we don't know how far this can go. And if you're unlucky and the quantum computer managed to guess your public key with your private key, then you've lost your funds. Mm. So there is always risk of that happening. Um, If China were to have a functioning and viable quantum computer before the West and chose rather than to attack US infrastructure, they chose to start stealing Bitcoin out of wallets, then, you know, maybe that's a risk. It it definitely is a risk. I think that there is quantum resistance built into the Bitcoin protocol um, that can be soft forked. So it's essentially ready to go. So I'm, you know, there's always risk. There's yeah. always risk. But I feel less concerned about the majority of risks that you would look at normal assets within that particular framing. Yeah. When Bitcoin drops, I definitely don't look at it and think, okay, maybe the bubble's deflating. I think this is a discount. This is an increased discount to what it already is a discount to fair value. Right. I think in general, this is a nice leeway into the game theory part I wanted to talk about, because you could say, right, like, okay, you, if you have this quantum computer and you want to direct it towards destroying Bitcoin, right, there's, there's people that argue, well, eventually the benefits of Bitcoin, of adopting it outweigh the benefits of attacking it, which I think is part of this global game theory, let's call it a d- discussion, right? But uh, yeah, what, so, sorry, what was your last point again? I want to say something about that. Uh, um, I was just talking about how, for me, this is the low, lowest risk of all financial assets. Mm-hmm. Um, if you think about when Bitcoin rallies, oh, yeah. you yeah. know, it's, it, or, or, it, or it falls, sorry, that's not a bubble deflating, that's a discount to already a very discounted price. Yeah, exactly. I think these fluctuations in price are also little ego tests, right? I mean, even after 10 years, I still feel this, well, two weeks ago, or when was it when we had this big, you know, global global crash in general, but I, I still feel it because I do look at the dollars in some way, right? Of course. Of course. But the main thing I always ask myself when I, when I feel that is like, okay, did any fundamentals change? And the answer is no, but the answer is always no. And that is the entire point. That's where the value comes from. Right, like, yeah. but Bram, yeah. you just made a very, very important point. You've been in this industry. Did you say you've been in the industry for ten years? Well, on and off, yes. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, ten years. You've yeah. been watching this and slowly learning about it, mm. and still a move like two weeks ago can make you think shit. Right, because I still feel it. Yes, correct. Of course, because yeah. of two things. One, you've been indoctrinated to think that U.S. dollar or euros are the most important thing, because that is what defines your life, right? Yes. For you to pay for your housing, for your family, for your food, for the rest of it, that's all denominated in euros and dollars. So of course you have this link to that world because right now you're not paying for anything in Bitcoin, right? Eventually it will become the unit of account and you know everything will likely be done on Lightning or some other layer two that, that works efficiently. But until that time, you're always going to have this unit bias problem. 
always, even after 10 years of looking at this. And you've been looking at it for longer than I have. You know, so imagine new listeners to your show and imagine how hard it is for them to look at it and go, 49,000, that's a buying opportunity. Yeah. It's really hard. Yeah, it is really hard. It's also, um, I love the stats also around this, right? Like uh, if you want to trade Bitcoin, you have to pay attention for like eight days in the entire year or something like that's where you can actually trade and benefit. Anyway, I think you should trade in the beginning or whatever you think you should do, right? And then, uh, and then you will lose a bit and then you will understand that you might be, not be a trader, um, you know, and then, and then you move on to just holding it. That's how I went. I did day trade for like three months. And then after three months, I was like, okay, this is not, uh, this is not, uh, not for me. And I have less Bitcoin than I had at that, um, at that moment in time. Right. So, I, I mean, it's, it's a valuable lesson eventually, you know, in, in, in building your understanding and, and the conviction. Ha happens to everyone. And it's part of the ego death, right? I think you, so. You thinking you can beat the market, you know, and that's why the, the very famous Bitcoin mantra, stay humble and stack sats, I think is a really important mantra for yeah. anyone coming into the space. This is, this is savings technology. And just because the German police are going to wake up one morning and sell 50,000 Bitcoin into the market on July 4th weekend does not mean that the asset is worth anything less. Exactly. In fact, contrary, that's when you should be buying. But if you're mucking around trying to trade it, you can get caught wrong on these things that have no logical sense in the performance of what this asset is doing. So, yeah. yeah. And so what's your view on the current state of institutional adoption? Do you, do you see it as like a Trojan, a Trojan horse? Is it Bitcoin needs Wall Street or Wall Street needs Bitcoin? I think uh, Wall Street needs Bitcoin, of course, um, because, you know, you look at it again, sitting down with the investor that I was sat with at lunch yesterday. He has to pay attention. Bitcoin has an average Kager of 56% since its inception. That is better than Renaissance Capital, which is the best hedge fund in the world. No investor can beat it. That's 15 years of 56% average return a year. Yeah. It's absolutely mind boggling. And I wouldn't be surprised to see it continue at very close to that rate. I think maybe 30 or 40% is entirely possible because you are going to get an exponential run. Institutions are starting to realize it. You've got pension funds like Wyoming, I think it's Wisconsin. Yeah, I think it's Wisconsin. Yeah. That have started to add the ETF. They add it, which means every other of the top 10 pensions in the US are going to say, hang on a minute. Why have you got that in your portfolio? I think, you know, BlackRock put out a very interesting paper a couple of years ago where they stated that the correct allocation for Bitcoin should have been about 85%. Yeah, I think it was 82. Yeah. yeah you know, this is. This is an asset that can continue to produce absolutely ridiculous returns because it's not just an asset. It's so much more than that. It's the base of our financial system. It's truth in a financial system. And you vote with where you put your money. And who's going to vote for truth over complete deception and theft? You're going to vote for truth all day long. Yeah. So Bitcoin is inevitable. 